I'll get started. Uh, my name is James Pepper. Today is July 31st, 2024. Um, and I call this, it's 1.03 p.m. and I call this meeting over. Um, just a few opening announcements before we turn to the agenda. Um, so uh, the CCB and Compliance Director David Rubin have decided to part ways. Um, this role uh, is incredibly challenging given the breadth and depth of knowledge that you need to have about all aspects of the supply chain. And I really wanna thank David for all the effort he put in. Um, we have elevated Mike DiTomaso, um, who's a compliance agent, uh, to fill in as interim director while we look for a permanent replacement. Mike is not in the office today, so I can really embarrass him. Um, <laughs> so uh, for those who don't know Mike, um, he spent his entire professional career working directly with cannabis. Uh, he came to the CCB from the Agency of Agriculture, where he oversaw all aspects of the hemp program, amongst other things. Um, and if memory serves, he was our very first compliance officer that Kerry hired um, before this market launched. So he has evolved right alongside this industry and knows it up close and personally. Uh, I've said this in the past, but my goal from the outset was to clearly articulate the CCB's core principles for this market and then create the least restrictive regulatory framework for cannabis that adheres to those principles. And I'm sure this doesn't always feel like the least restrictive regulatory framework, but you really don't get there overnight. It takes continuous reflection and refinement, and it means listening to people in the field about what's working and what's not, and learning from our mistakes. Mike is so well positioned to help us with this, especially as we head into rulemaking. So a huge thank you to Mike for stepping up to this challenge. And to all of your colleagues who inevitably will need to pick up some slack where you, while you're doing double duty. That um, tees up my next announcement nicely. I am so excited to introduce our new Deputy Compliance Director, Nicole West. Um, Nicole is a lawyer and coming to us from the Attorney General's office. You know, lawyers are usually on the receiving end of a lot of misplaced hatred, but honestly, Nicole's skills and expertise are exactly what our agency needs as the novelty and complexity um, of what we do and really just the sheer number of our enforcement issues continue to grow. Uh, we've heard the call for more clarity and consistency in our decision making. I really believe that Mike and Nicole and the complementary skill sets that they each bring are going to prove to be a powerful duo in continuing to build and refine our compliance infrastructure. Um, and, they, and they'll help us uh, help this industry grow and flourish. I uh, also wanted to remind everyone that the board is holding a series of licensee roundtables um, about the issues that are impacting your businesses. Um, we recognize it's a dynamic industry that's subject to so many different forces, most of which are outside of any one person's direct control. Um, that's, um, you know, so this is, and this is a very critical time of year. We're preparing to initiate rulemaking. We're developing our internal legislative agenda. And importantly, some of the legislative tax committees are requesting that we um, kind of re-examine our fee structure. And that fee review can be much more than just increasing or decreasing the amounts of fees. It could include things like changing product registration to a two-year renewal, or adding new license types, or modifying what existing licensees are authorized to do. Um, so at each of these round tables, we're trying to solicit your advice on what should change, either about our rules, um, the underlying statutes, or just the market structure in general. Um, the first one uh, focused on retailers and is available to watch on our YouTube page. The next one is a week from today at noon and is focused on product manufacturers. Um, my hope is to cover topics related to product registration, packaging, testing, the use of potentially hazardous foods and nutritional supplements in cannabis products. Um, but really, these are open ended con conversations and all topics are on the table. Um, then we'll be holding a cultivator specific roundtable the following week um, on August 14th at 1130 a.m. All the links to join um, and information are available on our events page. Um, we're also starting to coalesce around dates for the various Act 166 working groups um, that also cover a wide variety of topics, including improvements to the medical program, advertising, 
siting of outdoor cultivation and the future of the Cannabis Business Development Fund. We will keep our events calendar updated um, once those have been scheduled. So um, just next, we have to approve the minutes from our last regular board meeting, which was on June 26, 2024. Also our evidentiary hearing um, on July 10th and our special meeting on July 12th. You guys had a chance to look at those? Yep. Yes. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, moving down the agenda. Um, next is public comments. Um, We'll handle this the same way we always do. Um, if you join by the link and would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand. We'll do our best to call on you in the order that you raise your hand, and then we'll move to people that join by phone. Uh, first hand up is Tim Ryder. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, Tim, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and and proceed with your comment. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to offer that um, these roundtable discussions are really beneficial, and uh, would love to see, even though it obviously is a much smaller pool, that a wholesaler distributor um, roundtable should be held because we offer a very unique perspective on uh, being the connective tissue throughout um, kind of all aspects of the industry. And in many of your documentation and compliance and, and systems um, were oft forgotten. And I hate to be the squeaky wheel, but I really do think that it's beneficial to, uh, to have a, a say and a voice that could be really helpful in a lot of regards. Thank you for your time and I appreciate all you do. Yeah, thanks, Tim, and a great point. I've always thought that that was kind of an underutilized license type or that that could be kind of a pretty dynamic license type. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next hand up is Bridget Conry. Go ahead, Bridget. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. You're a little faint, but we can hear you, yes. Okay, awesome. I'll speak up. So I just want to say that the uh, retailer roundtable was really great last week. Really appreciated it. Found there was a lot of common ground among uh, license types, so that or the licensees, so that was great. One comment I wasn't able to make that I just would like to put in again um, is that it would be really valuable for retailers to have sales data. Just wondering if the CCB could give us an update on when we might have data on what's selling in the market, you know, the brands, the units, the, you know, just overall how we're doing because that's accessible in most other states. And so that's valuable data for retailers to understand how to plan. And it's also valuable for manufacturers to understand what are the products that are going to sell in the market. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, Bridget. Thank you. Any other public comments from people that join via the video link? Um, feel free to raise your virtual hands. And if you join by a phone, you can unmute by hitting star six. Uh, Liz Dion, go ahead. Hi there. Um, I am hoping that we might be able to implement or find a way to have like a um, cannabis control officer appreciation day or something of those sorts. I know we're not allowed to give any samples to our officers and they work so hard for us. And so um, I know like that obviously is seen as, you know, a bribery or all of that if it's, you know, throughout the year, but if there was like one designated day or we could even like take the company name off of it or whatever, just some way that we could have a day to celebrate them. And they work so hard and we wanna appreciate them in some way. <laughs> well, thanks for the comment. They do work incredibly hard. Um, and I think you just mentioning it is, you know, all the thanks that they really yeah, want. The public, <laughs> yeah, the public recognition is really good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Anyone else for a public comment, either phone or video? Again, star six to unmute your phone. All right, I'll close the public comment window then, and um, uh, we do have down. one more. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, Dave sorry. got his hand up uh, in time. Sorry about that. 
I'm sorry about that then. Um, um, I, hey, I, I thought you like to be first. I, I, I thought you like to be first in the queue. No, you know, sometimes it's good to be last and that way you get the last word. Um, I, I, I think, you know, just kind of piggybacking on, on the comment about data, um, you know, we, we talked about that a few months ago and, and the answer back then, it was like six months ago, and the answer back then was like any day now, um, and we haven't seen it. Um, and I think some of that ties into the um, inventory tracking system. And I wonder if maybe you have an update on, on what's going on there uh, and specifically whether you're going to, to try to integrate into the various systems that uh, many of your licensees are using, like, like Dutchie and Flowhub, um, rather than kind of doing manual reporting, um, just because it seems to me that the more you ask us to enter data into a state form, uh, the less reliable the information you're going to get from us is because, you know, just fat fingering and misunderstanding the, the fields that you're asking for. So, so is there an update that you can give on, on inventory tracking and specifically inventory tracking and integration? Thanks. Yep, thanks, Dave. Any other public comments before I close the public comment window? No. Okay. I'll close the public comment window. And I and I would just say on that we we have hired a data manager who's going in and trying to clean up some of the, like increase the data integrity of what we are getting. You know, obviously um, we ADS does not build our you know systems for us. They contract out. And so when we're under contract, it's easy to make modifications and tweaks. When we're outside of a contract, when that's been complete, we have to go back out to bid. And so it does the process of updating data systems, of updating inventory tracking requires a little bit of a lead time. Um, and that's the kind of process that we're in right now. But we do have a data manager that is working on trying to provide at least some kind of basic level data for, for people in the industry so you guys can make kind of good business decisions. Um, Olga, I think you're up on the yeah. list, Executive Director Report. Um, yes. And, uh, voices, recommendations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, he jumped his slide. Okay, well, that's a good slide to be on. Um, so, as always, we start with a summary of our educational outreach initiatives. Um, again, just a quick reminder to all that we host our monthly networking events for all current and prospective uh, cannabis establishment licensees. Uh, we advertise these events in our weekly newsletters. Um, again, a reminder, please make sure to sign up uh, and you can do so uh, by going to our website. Um, as you all probably know by now, the goal of this event is always to allow our community to connect and learn from the board and from the industry professionals. I think Pepper already uh, touched on the most recent event, which was the Retailer Roundtable with Julie. And the, fall, the upcoming two events will um, be held by the chair himself. And then Kyle uh, is going to host the Cultivator Roundtable later this month. So that's what's to come uh, on this. Um, so now I'm going to jump into the uh, licensing data for our adult use program. Uh, the data is as of the 15th of this month, unless noted otherwise on the individual slides. Okay, the first slide uh, shows, it's a 
known slide shows the uh, snapshot of all active li uh, licenses. Those include renewals, again, as of the 15th of this month. Uh, the total number is 564, which is a slight decrease from the last month's total of 567. Um, but overall, we are not showing any um, sort of worrying trends or uh, anything uh, of note here. Numbers are staying consistent month over month. Um, and this is actually a new slide uh, for the board. Um, so here, what we are showing um, is our current active licenses grouped by their original issue year. Um, those include renewed licenses. So if you were to say, look at the retailer data, right? You could tell, it's an easy one. 34 retailer licenses uh, were issued in 2022, our first year of issuing licenses. And uh, that is still active. 36 additional licenses were, that were issued in 23 are still active now. And so far this year, we have issued eight new licenses. So again, we know we have a total of 78, but you could see the year that their licenses were issued um, sort of, and it's still in business. Obviously, this means that uh, quite a few of the retailers have gone through the renewal process um, and are uh, continuing to stay and grow with the industry, which is something we want to track. Again, this slide may help us uh, identify community interest in different license types year over year. Uh, and we can also better assess the longevity of the various license types. Um, so again, the goal is to monitor this uh, data for any emergent trends. Um, but that's a new new slide this month. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, and now that's a familiar slide um, that is uh, looking at the active um, licenses through the lens of their priority status. Um, very similar to the last month's data, just a slight decrease in the number of standard licensees um, down to 62% from 60. Four. Um, I believe overall numbers are pretty steady. Um, and you could see we have both the numbers and corresponding percentages listed on the slides. All right, moving on. Uh, again, another familiar slide to you all. Um, that's a snapshot of all the active cultivator licenses. Uh, as of the 15th of this month, again, the numbers remain relatively stable with only slight fluctuations. Um, over the last months, we uh, had a slight decrease across all tiers, actually, down three for the indoor group, um, down two for the outdoor, and our mixed license category decreased from 113 to 109. So the overall decrease, um, from last month is by nine. So we had 394. Um, what size cultivation tier were those, do you know? Uh, where we decreased, okay. actually not entirely sure. Yeah, okay, we might, I'll be able to get you that, yeah. Um, but again, I actually took a quick look at our April data and at that time we had 394. Um, so there is a little, back and forth and maybe just a renewal. Um, that's what's throwing the numbers a little bit. Okay. But we'll look into that. Um, okay. Uh, let's see, uh, that's our manufacturers. Um, we've gained uh, four uh, licenses in tier two um, and the total went up to 78 from 74. Again, the majority of our operators remain tier two. So that's uh, on this, and now we're going to look at their relinquishments. We have a couple slides here. So this slide we've seen before, this data represents all relinquishments uh, since the outset. Um, I took a quick look uh, sort of back, and currently we are at 99 relinquishments, um, and the numbers have grown. It was 64 in April, we went up to 76 in May, 82 in June, and now we're at 99. So the trend is um, 
sort of single digits up to 10, 11, um, up to 15. I think this month is the biggest jump, 17 relinquishments. Um, but that's what we are seeing in terms of the numbers. Um, but in terms of the proportion of licenses relinquishing their license by priority status, it stays roughly the same as the proportion of licenses by priority status. So. Question on relinquishments that mm -hmm. I don't need an answer for right yeah. now. But, uh, is are these mostly um, relinquishing at the time of renewal, or are they like mid-cycle relinquishments? Is it people kind of like fit crashing out, or is it people deciding not to renew? Usually, it's at the time of the renewal. The majority of those, yes, they are. But we could look into that more. But yeah, it's usually one. Um, yep. Okay. Um, and there's our another slide. That's also a new slide. Um, that um, addresses relinquishment. So here, we sort of we are attempting to show the trajectory of the relinquishments over time by the priority status. Um, you could see that orange is our standard category, green is economic empowerment, and blue is social equity. Um, I was trying to find any trends there, but uh, as you could see in June, uh, we had reported 13 relinquishments, so a majority of them were standard. And this, in July, um, we're showing five that came uh, from our economic empowerment licensees. So, um, so far, we just we have this data. Uh, we're always looking for trends, um, but right now um, we're not seeing any red flags or anything that stands out to us. But we'll keep looking at it. You can see it's monthly, it's from the very beginning, from our very first licenses uh, that got relinquished uh, through this month. There is the slide. Okay. Yep, uh, let's see. Um, okay, there's our quick slide. Um, to just uh, touch on the renewals, uh, just one slide here this month. Um, again, this just looks at the proportion of renewals in which our cultivators and manufacturers are changing something about their license. And again, percentages um, uh, staying relatively stable. Most of our licensees, 85%, um, choose to remain with their original types and tiers. So again, um, not much here. So. By just doing one slide this month. Okay. Okay, moving on, moving on. So, this is another slide that we've seen regularly. Um, that's our uh, licensed canopy capacity square footage. Uh, we are now at um, 935,500 square feet. Uh, we did not report any changes in the outdoor license canopy um, when compared to the prior month's data. The indoor capacity has dropped by 12,000 um, square feet. That's the latest on this. Okay. And the next, again, switching gears here and touching on our uh, retail locations and areas of density. Um, Towns with two or more retail locations uh, and or retail applications in a queue are uh, represented here. Uh, we've seen a gain in the number of applications in the queue. Looks like we got four additional applications reported and compared to June, uh, Burlington, of course, and Morrisville areas have the highest concentrations um, of retailers as shown in our report. Um, so that's uh, the retail uh, information. Um, the next couple of slides are on our pre-qualification data. Uh, so here's the current picture of applications, pre-qualification applications um, through actually uh, the 24th of this month. Uh, to, uh, and yes, to date we have received a total of 168. Um, and there's a consistent growth. I think I looked with where 133 in April, so they're trickling in. Um, the chart above show uh, the chart here shows uh, a breakdown um, of uh, the various statuses, um, and you could see that the largest subset of our pre-qualification applicants, uh, 78, uh, they have been approved. Um, 
you know, and I have a few more slides and we'll see some additional insight into the uh, trends um, and look closer at some of this numbers. So yeah, 78 have been approved out of 168. And if we look here, uh, this is a new slide. Um, so here we are looking, uh, we're trying to figure out um, the specific types of licenses that our applicants are most interested in pursuing. So again, out of 168 pre-qual submissions so far, uh, the majority of businesses uh, have, uh, have been interested in indoor cultivator tier one. So you could see 66 is um, that number, followed by uh, the interest in retailer licenses. 32. Um, notably, we are reporting for the first time that we have received two pre-qualification applications for the new propagator license type that became available on July 1st. Uh, so they are reported here as well. But that's a breakdown um, what folks are interested in pursuing. Um, and let's see. And now um, here's a little breakdown focusing on the pre-qualification approvals. Uh, again, consistent as expected and consistent with the previous slide, our indoor cultivator tier one and our retailer uh, licenses have secured the most approval with 38 and 13 respectfully out of the total of 70. So we are tracking, um, <coughs> tracking right along with this. Um, and one more slide here on pre-qualification information um, that this shows that, let me see, um, that 35 out of 78 um, pre-qualification approvals have since been converted into full applications, which is just under 45% uh, of total pre-approved pre-qualification applications to date. Uh, and again, you can see the breakdown that 17 of those have moved, um, have applied for their indoor cultivator tier one, showing continued interest in this license type and tier. So that is our uh, pre-qualification sort of uh, information for the months. And there's no fee for pre-qualification, so no, no, it's, it's a good thing if anyone's yeah. kind of curious to go through pre-qualification and see if it's right for them. All right, uh, so next we are going to touch on, now we have a even separate slide right here, and following the board's interest for a deeper dive into our product registration data, our staff has compiled several key data points, and the next few slides will give a comprehensive overview of our PR work uh, to date, and we'll base um, that, um, uh, those slides of the data from this calendar year through July 15th. So that's uh, what we are going to look at next. So again, all of the slides, or most of them will be new to you. So this one, the first slide, uh, shows all of the um, PR submissions for the time frame, uh, including renewals and new submissions both. Um, the total number of submissions received, regardless of their eventual or pending outcome, is 2,523 submissions. So it's in the last six and a half months. Um, this chart provides uh, a more specific breakdown of how these product registrations are distributed across different product types. Um, as you can tell, flower continues to be the main product type. Uh, roughly 57% of all PR submissions uh, flower. Yeah, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. So yeah. these numbers are all of the registrations and the renewals of registration. So there aren't necessarily, you know, 1,400 different flower products on the market. There might be the same product that's been renewed. Yeah, so there's submissions, right? It's yeah. everything that was sent to us okay. um, over the last six and a half months, okay. either for new products or for existing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and here on this slide, um, we, what we are doing here, we are comparing only the product registration approval data for the same time period uh, when looking at 2023 and 2024. So this is a comparison chart. So basically what it does, it shows that over the same time frame, frame we have nearly doubled 
the number of product registrations processed and more importantly approved uh, by our team. Um, so what are we seeing right now is right that out of uh, almost over 2,500 submissions, uh, 2,321 um, submissions have been approved this year. Yeah, it, it, we looked at this, it's just shy of 92% of all submissions um, for this calendar year that have already been approved. Um, and obviously half of that last year uh, during that time frame. Um, next, so we are digging even deeper here. Again, looking at the same six months uh, of the current calendar year. Um, so what you're seeing here, again, the majority of submitted uh, product registrations have been registered. That's 2,321. And then there is this smaller um, segment of the pie chart, the purple um, slice called other. And that one represents the group of PRs that for various reasons have not been approved. Um, and then you could see, taking a closer look at that specific group of 202, you could look, you could see different uh, statuses and outcomes for this uh, PR applications. So 79 of them, uh, the blue block, um, have been deemed incomplete. 51 uh, were still, let's see if there was 50, yeah, submitted, but are yet to be reviewed by our staff. Uh, 31, I think, have been withdrawn, um, and there are various other reasons. Again, that was sort of, uh, as of the day we pulled that data, those were the statuses for their, um, those purple um, uh, other uh, types. Um, oh, so sorry, you guys skip. Um, yes. Oh. Um, so if you... Yeah, so other reasons why some of these PR applications have not been registered are also seen here. Yeah, we're looking at this. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. So um, is there a back and forth with product registration like there is a little bit with licensing mm -hmm. or something? So theater is it, right? So ultimately, yeah. 2,300 products were registered, but this doesn't really account for the amount of time to get them to registration. Correct. Okay. I do have a slide later oh, in this great. presentation that can yeah. shed a little light on, on the timing of the way those. you anticipate a need. Oh, we <laughs> did. The team, by we, I mean, our staff has pulled a lot of um, slides together to kind of help us. Yes. Um, yeah. So we'll look into that just a bit. Um, but if we are ready to move on to the next one. Okay. So this is a look at the incomplete product registration, right? And understand why our staff has deemed some of these submissions incomplete. So again, the data was pulled on July 15th. And at the time, we identified 79 inc incompletions. And so this chart breaks down the reasons for these incompletions. Um, the primary issue uh, here is uh, deficiencies with the label, 28. Uh, you know, followed by several other reasons, um, you know, need for more information on the list, issues with packaging, missing certificates of analysis, uh, a few other reasons. Again, uh, we're looking forward collecting this data with some regularities so that our team can also understand these reasons better and uh, that will allow our team um, an ability to uh, support applicants um, in getting their uh, submissions through the finish line. Um, so this is a, not a new subset of data here. Is this all time, or is this no, no. this is that same? It, it 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 no. It literally is on the day that we pulled this data on the fifteenth of July. Okay. So this is this changes in real time, just as the number of incompletions. So this was um, as of that day. But I do think it's based on the data. Yes, I think I misunderstood your question. Yes, we pulled this data as of the 15th, but it does address the time frame from January through July 15th, um, all of this incomplete reasons. Yeah. So thinking about the value of product registration is why, right? Yeah. Yeah. This well, I'm just, helpful. yeah, I know. Thank you for putting this together. Like, you know, obviously, I'm, while the label is important and it really helps distinguish a legitimate product, product maybe. I guess an illegitimate one. It's got the information that the health department and others want on there. But like to me, like the potency, pesticide, pathogen, COA, all. I mean, 
those are all product recall, avoided product recalls right there. I mean, probably all of them are avoided product recalls, but you know, it's just think about the the damage. label probably to some extent too. You know, the label to, to some yeah, extent too, but yeah, not from a public health perspective, I right. guess. Okay, we ready to go to the next slide? Okay. Um, okay, so this is another, this is a closer look at the denied and rejected product registrations. Um, again, um, the ones that we pulled from this time frame, and you could see the most, the one that hit the most denials is uh, for hemp derived cannabinoids and out of state provider of, of hemp emulsion leader. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so that is this information. Um, moving on again, another product registration um, slide. So this uh, sort of shows the proportion of uh, various product types through the lens of new product submissions versus renewals. Um, so you could tell probably by looking at this chart that the proportions vary wildly, uh, widely depending on the specific products, right? So if we look at the topicals, it's very nearly matched, um, but for extract, it's up to 10% that are current, currently coming through as renewals. Um, again, we'll continue to watch uh, this to better understand the prevalence of different products and how new registrations compare to renewals. But uh, something we are looking into now yeah no i just think one of the main points i think that hits all of those licensee roundtables is how do we improve this process so even mm -hmm. doing that kind of deep dive internally and here in this meeting but you know anytime there's suggestions about how to improve that process you know i still think the value of a pre-approval is demonstrated by these slides you know mm -hmm. certainly there's a delay of getting products to market delay the kind of the piece of these the industry but if it's saving us, if it's saving negative public health outcomes, you know, we're just trying to weigh how much delay is worth the kind of beneficial outcomes. But I'm open to any and all ideas on how to improve processes. We'll continue to collect data yes. to help yeah. support that effort, uh, for sure. Um, okay. And I think there's another quick slide that basically represents the same data related to the proportion of renewals to new applications, um, but in percentages. So again, if you look at edibles, it shows that so far this year, 28% were renewals and this 72 would be new uh, PR applications for uh, edibles. Another chart on this. Um, okay, and let's see the next slide here. Uh, and this is us looking at just the uh, product registration renewals. Um, there were 410 reported uh, so far this calendar year, um, which represents about 16% of all submissions. Um, and again, flower continues to dominate um, re uh, renewal process, uh, but that tells you what else is out there that's being renewed um, and the numbers. And now to the slide um, related to the timelines. So this is a different data subset. So this slide shows the average number of days from PR submission to registration by the product type. So that's a new slide here. And you could see at a glance that topicals take the longest to approve or have taken the longest to approve this calendar year at least, averaging 35 days and flower and the other category um, usually get quicker approvals. In terms of the other category, it includes seeds, clones, beverages, vape cards, um, live resin cards, bottle hash. Um, so those are on the list there. Um, but that sort of gives you a little bit look, uh, inside look into what have been happening with the approval process in terms of the timing. And I think I have one other slide also related to timing. Um, and that's the final slide on PR. So this slide examines uh, the duration from submission to approval uh, for product registrations. Um, 
you could see right here that 643, which is 27.5%, um, have been approved in under one week. Um, 20, additional 20% uh, have been approved within two weeks, that's 473. And then on the other end of the spectrum, 455, representing 19% of all approved submissions, have taken over a month to complete. Again, we'll be monitoring this data closely as we all continue to streamline uh, our internal processes and improve efficiencies of the re uh, review process. But we have access to this data, which is really helpful for the team as well. It would be helpful to know if there's mm -hmm. something in common with the ones that approved within a week versus more than a month. Is it because they turn in everything that's needed right away or you know what what it, what do those have in common the ones that are approved the quickest and the ones that are approved the slowest yeah yeah we could definitely look into that and sort of see if we can find those trends um, yeah okay so that wraps it up wraps up our product registration portion of the presentation and we are on to the compliance data next um, so compliance numbers uh, for the months, um, you could see here, our agents conducted a total of 60 regular inspections and they're working through 18 active investigations. Uh, this chart details the specific types of licenses that are subject to these inspections and investigations. Uh, the field numbers are a bit lower than we typically see from the compliance team, but it's mostly uh, due to our staff taking some time off over the last few weeks. Uh, and also some of their work being disrupted by the recent uh, weather events. So that's um, what you're seeing here. Uh, and a little closer look here. Um, so you could see that we got, um, we have our numbers related to the complaints um, and all of the other compliance actions, uh, all of the compliance actions um, that our team has been busy uh, Taken care of, um, we had two new notices of violations um, and they um, eight product destructions. Yeah, you could see it in a chart, um, the work that they've been doing. And in terms of this uh, complaints, this next chart um, digs further into the types of violations that have been reported or observed. Um, and uh, you could see uh, that they cover a range of topics, but advertising uh, violations and financial disputes uh, have been the most common complaints received in the last months. So that's what we are seeing in the field right now. And on that topic, we have a, a quick slide on uh, the advertising. So this is a data for uh, the time frame from June 15th through July 15th. And we tried to share this information with the board at least quarterly to offer an insight into the work of our advertising team. So on this slide, you could see that we received 25 individual uh, advertisement requests for review. Um, they all came with varying levels of complexity. Um, you could see nine of them were denied and the slide further breaks down the reasons for denials showing that most of them were due to the issues with the health warning. Uh, we always, the team always encourages resubmissions and most licensees in fact correct and resubmit and um, eventually receive approvals. So um, that's been our experience with that. Good, um, and now we are ready to talk about our medical program. Uh, just one slide here, um, and no surprises here, we continue to see a steady decline in the numbers. Um, so the medical patient number uh, dropped from 2,781 in June to 2,712 in July. Um, the, num the count of caregivers increased slightly from 116 to 119. So, uh, that's where we are at. And that decrease might not even fully grasp yeah. the number of people that are leaving the program because now their card is valid for three years. Mm -hmm. And just because they're not, just because we're not seeing a decrease here, yeah. it could be that uh, 
they're just in a three year renewal, but have already decided not to use their dispensaries. Uh, and that's about it. Now we're at the point of um, staff recommendations for licensure. Um, and as always, we begin with our initial licenses, and then we have a list of license renewals. Um, we have a lot of uh, licenses up uh, this month. Uh, we also have a list of um, late renewal applications for the board's review. Uh, how would you want to go back? Let's start with the new and renewals, and then we'll move to the late. Okay. Treat, treat them separately. Great. So let's move on then. So this is our staff's recommend list uh, for initial licensure. Um, I think it's just one slide. So you're not reading them just for anyone to join by a phone if there is anyone these will be posted to our website um, by the end of the day so I can read, read them there but what, there's like 15 of them maybe 10 of them. Oh, that's a lot okay so I'm gonna uh, go to the next um, and this is our first renewal license renewal slide I'll go to the next. Uh, that's another renewal slide. Okay, moving on. Our third renewal slide. Again, our fourth slide. Okay. Um, next. Again, I believe that's our last um, slide with license renewals. Great. And the next um, next couple of slides um, is always the late renewal applications uh, for Rule uh, 115D. All of these businesses have provided an explanation letter. Uh, with their submissions, um, which uh, those letters have been shared with the board. And uh, staff recommends all but one uh, for the board's approval. Um, and I think we have some information and then Gabe may be able, might be able to give us um, the board um, a little more information about the one that's um, I think it's uh, Vermont Green Mountain grown um, on that second page. Um, so this is uh, this one was brought to me for a look. Um, this is submission 8905 for Vermont Green Mountain Grown. The board did receive a very brief narrative explanation under rule one, as you know, under rule one when the 30 when the application deadline that occurs 30 days before the expiration date is passed, acceptance by the board is discretionary. Um, there was an application, a late application request made of the board that the application be accepted. In this case, there are two um, omissions. One is insurance information and the other is um, banking information. Um, it's um, in the binder that we have from last year was July 1 to July 1, 23. And the narrative explanation does seem to make clear that there is no insurance at this time. So um, that kind of works a legal impediment to um, renewing the license, um, and it makes the application incomplete. The application also contains no banking information in this regard. So unfortunately, that, but there isn't enough there for the board to make a decision. If we look back through the 2023 application, um, 
to see if there was anything that might be from which inferences might be derived to say that it is. And unfortunately, we don't find that. Um, so for that reason, I don't think you have a complete application. Although you have a request to take it up, um, and the request doesn't really explain why um, so late. Although it's clear that the, there may be some property transaction going on that may be confusing the folks' business. Um, but I don't think they have anything that we could work with it. Any questions for Gabe or Olga about these? Well, so just by way of discussion, I know at this point I'm being a broken record, but I always do think it's important to be clear about our processes and why they are the way that they are. Um, you know, to me, everything starts with cannabis being a controlled substance um, that's illegal to invest and sell in Vermont unless you have a license with the CCB. And, um, a valid unexpired license. It's not just a piece of paper, it's your protection from law enforcement potentially seizing your property and charging you with a crime. Um, if you ever dealt with law enforcement, you'll know that there is no nuance to the question of whether you have a license or not. They're not asking us whether there's some sort of incomplete renewal in our licensing portal. Uh, you know, they're you know, the consequences of a licensee not maintaining continuous licensure um, is dramatic. And so we've created processes for ensuring that we don't allow licenses to inadvertently lapse. Um, these are laid out in Rule 1.15. They start with a reminder that licenses are only good for one year. That was a legislative determination. Those guys wanted us to kind of lift the hood and kick the tires of your business yearly. And they also want annual fee revenue. Um, from there, Rule 115, 1 1.15 goes on to say that you can submit your application 90 days prior to your expiration date, but you must complete a, submit a complete application at least 30 days prior to that expiration so that we have time to give it final review or initiate kind of a cessation of operations um, so that you're not stuck holding a bunch of cannabis that you're not lawfully allowed to possess. Um, uh, you know, again, that is a complete application, at least 30 days prior to your expiration date. This is not your renewal deadline. I mean, this is your renewal deadline. Uh, you know, complete application usually is not complete in its first attempt. Um, so it's really important to start early with this. Um, usually there's something missing and you receive an incomplete letter from us, from your licensing agent. Um, so waiting until that 30 day renewal deadline and hoping you did everything right is a pretty big gamble. Um, so, you know, I, I know that it, there's a lot there and we do expect a lot of our licensees. And I personally am willing to take my share of the responsibility for some of these late renewals. Um, you know, we wrote these rules, 1.15 and all of them, um, you know, almost a full year before we even issued our first license, let alone our first renewal. Um, and just the sheer number of late renewals um, submissions that we're seeing, to me, is a good indicator that we didn't get everything right, that we need to re-examine the process and make it easier for everyone. I, when I was reading the reasons for some of this, a lot of it relies on a background check, people a pending background check. And, you know, that, sh to me, should be at the top of our list um, to think about how we deal with background checks at renewal as opposed to initial application. Um, but while we adjust our processes, you know, the fundamental point remains that continuous licensure protects your business, protects you. Submitting a complete application 30 days prior to your ex actual expiration date is critical. Um, you know, we're, I am still of the opinion we need to make exceptions for people that are making a good faith effort at following the rules. They're in communication with us. They're not totally blowing us off. But you know, when it comes to people that um, are not engaging or intentionally not following the rules, you know, it's not even a rule, it's a law that you have to maintain insurance and bank accounts. You have to treat those people differently. So okay, that's, those are the comments that I have before we decide to take action. And I think just for framing purposes, at least I learned in the last legislative session, these aren't really renewals. You have to apply for a new license every year. That's the way the statute was written. So to think of it like that, the way the statute was written, 
people have to reapply for their license every year. It's not like we can just check and make sure everything's okay and renew it. It's not the same. Um, and that is something maybe we could work on. Yeah, I just want to echo both of or echo what both of you said. You know, I'm I'm happy to take ownership as as you alluded to that you know we need to revisit our internal processes. We're only also meeting monthly now instead of weekly when we were renewing licenses at least last year at a clip that didn't leave some people in this kind of purgatory between board meetings. And I think we can figure out some ways to kind of um, prevent some of those issues. I'm just asking everybody to take and do an internal audit of their own internal SOPs on when they actually start their renewal process. Because if we can improve our processes, but folks need to meet us halfway in that endeavor. This Sometimes it's not good enough to get your homework in before the clock strikes midnight. Um, there's a lot of different reasons that are given on why you're unable to get a complete application in before the deadline. Some of them are about background checks. Some are trouble with the system. Some are my dog ate my proverbial homework. And that can work once, but there's no guarantee it's going to work in the years subsequent to this year or under a different board if you're going to be operating in this in this market long after the three of us are gone. So. Take the auto-generated email seriously. Please be in touch with licensing. Start the process before you need to. I know everybody would prefer to not be doing paperwork, but your paperwork here helps to ensure your livelihood. And I think it's extremely important that everybody take that incredibly seriously. So if there's no more discussion, why don't we break up the votes between the staff recommendations for initial licensure and renewal? and then deal with the late applications in a separate vote. And just as a point of clarity, we are not considering at all Mont Green Mountain Grove because their application is not complete. I think they're complete. Right. Because under rule one, they've essentially requested that the board accept the application. And I think the staff's recommendation is that the board decline the request because okay. the application is incomplete at this okay. time. So is there a motion to approve the staff recommendations for initial licensure and renewal? Um, I move that the board adopt the staff recommendations for initial licensure um, of the listed applicants. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now is there a separate motion about accepting staff recommendations regarding uh, us to accept late applications? I move that the board adopt staff recommendations for license renewal. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, any other business we need to deal with? We had to do the, the late. They were separate. Right? Well, we kind of. Oh, sorry. Together. Yeah, and, okay. It was a staff recommendation for them. But we just but, yeah. There. So if we do them as a staff recommendation, you it's understood what those are. Really, okay. all of the renewals recommended were recommended favorably except the one that was discussed and that okay. one is rejected for acceptance so as long as um that is un understood intent of the board yep. i think we're okay yes i think that i have a third paragraph oh. <laughs> <laughs> i don't have to read it that's okay <laughs> All right well a tremendous amount of work both by the people that were applying and the staff i mean it's so many so many licenses to get through, so many applications to get through. Thank you all. Uh, and I will adjourn this meeting.